development professional. That, that's what I am these days. That's somebody who works on promoting economic development, uh, development of a civil society in countries which are considered in some sense underdeveloped. Uh, the, the sense in which these countries are considered underdeveloped is that the, the World Bank, USAID and others want to fund for faster, better development in these countries. Uh, but it's a tough business, it's a complicated job uh, to do economic development. There are no set recipes there are many success stories, but we don't trust them because they're so beautifully packaged that you don't really know what was going on underneath the packaging. Um, and it's full of conceptual traps. Um, one of the conceptual traps that development professionals are exposed to is something I like to call the Bombay Laughing Club theory of development. I don't know if you know about these laughing clubs. Uh, the one in Bombay uh, was made famous by a, a documentary in the 80s. Uh, they're built on the observation that people who are healthy mentally and physically tend to laugh more. So if you want to be healthy, you should laugh. And so they get together and they, they force themselves to laugh, they trigger laughter with the assumption that, you know, if uh, healthy people uh, are, tend to laugh, then laughy people will be healthy, I don't know. So, and this is, um, strikes most people as unreasonable. Uh, the reaction is one of incredulity because it seems to violate this distinction between causation and correlation. In other words, uh, laughter and, and health are not cause and effect relationships, people think, they are correlated. They just happen to, to take place at the same time. Uh, but people are much more tolerant of this laughing club approach to development when it's applied in the economic development or civil society world. Uh, so, for example, we, we observe that uh, healthy civil societies uh, tend to have watchdog groups, for example. These are groups that monitor um, the behavior of government or large corporations along certain issues. And so, we as development professionals are now willing to invest in promoting watchdog groups, giving grants, training, etc with the assumption that if healthy societies have watchdog groups, therefore developing watchdog group will... And this, this could work, I suppose. Um, it, I don't know if it has worked. It, it certainly hasn't been proven not to work. But this is, it's an example in my mind of this, uh, uh, this uh, laughing club theory of development. Uh, another example from economic growth, a very popular um, development projects that... Um, take the model of competitive clusters. So it's based on the observation that the fashion industry in Paris, for example, or the cut flower industry in, in Amsterdam is, are all run in these very um, symbiotic, through very symbiotic relationships between players in, a, in an economic cluster. So in the fashion industry, it could be fashion designers, yes, but also modeling agencies, wholesalers, the, uh, graphic designers, and all kinds of different businesses collaborating. So again, the assumption is if healthy competitive economies are based on clusters, uh, then in order to promote um, a healthy, a healthy uh, and, and vibrant um, economic sector in the country, w we should make sure that the clusters develop. So if you want a healthy growing economy, uh, start building your, your clusters developing country. And, and so this is just one example for me of, of the traps we development professionals face. This may, be, may or may not be good policy, it may or may not work. Um, and it, it's very interesting to me to, to ponder the, um, the ethics of being a development professional, the professional ethics of development. In that sense, uh, for the past two years, I've been working on a set of projects which take a slightly different approach and we constantly worry about the, the ethics and the responsibility of how we're going about this, especially because it's, uh, I think all of these approaches are fairly untested, but this is, in addition to being untested, this approach is something that um, is not used very often in other contexts. And it's one based on catalyzing development. And I'll just say a few words about that based on an example. Uh, one of our most exciting projects right now is uh, the Tatev Revival Project. So in Armenia, in the south of Armenia, uh, we're trying to develop tourism uh, by focusing a lot of our resources on this one project, 
which we hope will catalyze development throughout the rest of the country in, in tourism. And that it will do so better than, uh, let's say, a, um, what I'd like to call the um, textbook table of contents approach, which, which tries to fix everything that needs to be fixed in the country. If in tourism, that would be the tourism law, the um, taxation environment, uh, hospitality training, uh, tourism infrastructure, etc. In, in this case, we're saying, no, let's try to see if we can develop a project that's large enough and interesting enough and strategic enough that it could actually jumpstart the rest of the, the, the sector. Uh, within the project itself, in the kind of fractal level, there are components of the projects that act, have the same effect on the rest of the project. And I want to give you an example of that. In order to do that, th let me describe this, uh, this, uh, the content of the project just a little bit. Uh, Datev Monastery is a thousand-year-old jewel of Armenian architecture. Um, which um, is vast, vastly under, underutilized. It, it, it's, it, 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 does, it hasn't risen to its potential as a destination as much as other similar monuments in the world have or other, other monuments in, in Armenia. Um, our challenge was to renovate the monastery because it's in bad, bad uh, disrepair. The, the region surrounding the monastery is also very impoverished there are no hotels to speak of. There, there are a couple of very nice boutique hotels in the region, but with not enough capacity. Um, but the approach we took added one component to the traditional uh, mix of restoration and so on, which is we decided to build the world's longest aerial tramway that crosses the river gorge across which Dat Dat Datev, the monastery, is located. Uh, the reason I mentioned the tramway especially is because we were criticized in the beginning, and still are, for investing over $10 million in building this new infrastructure, whereas the state of the roads in the region are in complete disrepair. So the community depends on these roads. Uh, there are many interesting tourism destinations within the valley around the monastery, which are only accessible by these roads. Um, and the question was, why are you building a new infrastructure, an aerial tramway, that can only take 25 people every 10 minutes across to Tatev, and you're leaving the roads in disrepair. Is this the right way to spend your first $12 million? And I think the answer is, of course, yes, it is. And, and I think we have shown now uh, how this would work. The idea was if, if we do something impactful enough and attractive enough, it will create consensus, it will create confidence, and it will start generating more investments, more commitments into the region. And not only will roads get built, but everything else will start falling into place in an ideal world if we do it right, if the triggers are right. And in fact, uh, we saw that the government of Armenia, which had, I think rationally, neglected the development of those roads for over a decade, because there just wasn't enough economic activity and tourism there, uh, when we started this project, decided to build the roads. And so now we're happy to, to, to find out that they will have finished paving the entire stretch of road from the highway all the way to Tatev, the monastery, uh, the, the span which we are spanning with the aerial tramway at the same time as, as we're doing the, the tramway. So our ropeway, which soars over the, the, the valley at 300 meters, will be inaugurated at the same time as the new road building. In addition to that, people are starting to think in investing in hotel construction across the valley from Tatev, and other, and other types of development initiatives. Um, now, I want to leave you with two messages from this. One is don't try this at home, unless your home is a small country, because this stuff probably really works in countries that are small enough to feel the impact of a relatively small project. For us, it's a large, it's a large project, but it's not a countrywide, big-scale project. But I think for a small country, this is the way to go. Um, also, it helps if you, your country has a large diaspora, like Armenia has. But a lot of small countries th these days have a lot of people, are storing a lot of their brain trust abroad, if you will, through brain drain, et cetera. Um, and the other message is, uh, it's a quote by William Gibson, a science fiction writer that I, I like a lot, um, which is, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. <laughs> which means that we really need to focus on less on everything that's keeping us down, on the parts of the map where the future is less here, and on the parts where the future is more here, because everything else can catch up um, 
may catch up, but if we concentrate too much on the low-lying parts, we'll probably stay there. Thank you.